Hello and welcome to this Beyond Exploring session. This is the last session for Thomas of Woodstock, or at least in this particular format. Um, the story so far, it's, it's the, the fourth episode of this, really. Do you, if you, if you want to plot synopsis, you really have come to the wrong place. Um, Richard II's turned against his uncles and his uncles have turned against him. And Richard II has just inflicted a home invasion on the title character Thomas of Woodstock and kidnapped him um, and uh, the, uh, the the things are not going to go well um, spoilers there uh, it's uh, going to be a, a, a tricky old day uh, for, for <laughs> some of the characters here um, but without further ado because we have got quite a lot of text to get through and uh, and a lot I'm sure to say because we always have a lot to say about Thomas Woodstock we will go into the team who is swelled to this great crush today uh, to help read us through so uh, reading the part of Tresillian and the Ghost of the Black Prince is Alexandra and when I'm not in confinement I act professionally and reading the part of Crosby, murderer number two, and Arundel is... Hi, I'm Alan. I'm based in Suffolk. I'm not a professional actor. And reading the parts of Nimble, murderer number one, and the Glo Duchess of Gloucester is... Hi, I'm Tamara. I am a professional actress, but I am currently stuck in Germany when I'm usually in London. And reading the part of Shreve of uh, the, the uh, North, uh, Northumberland, I think. Uh, Woodstock and York is... Hi, I'm Pamela. I am also an actor and I am also in London. And uh, reading the part of the Shreve of Kent and Richard II is... Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian, but I'm stuck in Yorkshire. And reading the, reading the part of Fleming, Scroop, Soldier and Lancaster is... Hi, I'm Liz Hill and I'm in North Devon. And uh, reading the part of uh, Bushy and Lapool is... Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm an actor, writer and director based in Germany. And uh, reading the part of Surrey and Green and stepping in for this session is... Hi, I'm Steve Longster. I'm a scholar of early modern drama and I'm based in Lancaster in the UK. And finally, new to the group, uh, be gentle everyone, be kind, is uh, reading the part of Bagot, uh, the ghost of Edward III and Shady is... Hi, I'm Valentina, I'm an actor and voiceover artist and I'm stuck in London. <laughs> ah, and so this is our team. We're in the midst of Act 4, we're in Act 4, Scene 3, and uh, we are going to uh, head to the, uh, the somewhat uh, corrupt uh, justices of, uh, of Tresillian and his, uh, uh, his minions, as it were. Uh, more details on that, I'm sure, will uh, follow. But uh, we are going to start with the entrance of Crosby, Fleming and Nimble. Come, sirs, attend. My lord is coming forth. The high shreves of Kent and Northumberland. The Twenty gentlemen are all arrested. The privy whisperers against the state, in which I know my lord will find some trick to seize their goods. And then there's work for us. Nay, there will be work for the hangman first. Then we write for the goods and my lord seizes the lands. If these 700 whisperers that are taken off uh, that are taken come off lustily, he'll have the devil and all shortly. Enter Tresillian with the Shreves of Kent and Northumberland with officers. See, see, they're coming. Tresillian. Oh, looks like we may have lost Tresillian. Um, Yes, we, we may have lost uh, uh, Alexandra. Um, you want me to read in? I'm not in this scene. Then please do, yes. Yes, I don't think I am. I haven't appeared. <laughs> um, call for a marshal there. Commit the traitors. We do beseech your honour. Hear or speak. So we'll not hear ye. The proof's too plain against ye. Becomes it you, sir, being Shreve of Kent, to stay the blanks King Richard sent abroad. Revile our messages, refuse the charters, and spurn like traitors against the king's decrees. My lord, I plead our ancient liberties. 
recorded and then rolled in the King's Crown office, wherein the men of Kent are clear discharged of fines, fifteens, or any other taxes, forever given them by the conqueror. You are still deceived. Those charters were not sent to abrogate your ancient privilege, but for his highness use they were devised to gather and collect amongst his subjects such sums of money as they might well might spare, and he in their defence must hourly spend. Is not the subject's wealth at the king's will? What? Is he lord of lives and not of lands? Is not his high displeasure present death? And dare ye stir his indignation so? We are free born, my lord, yet do confess our lives and goods are at the king's dispose. But how, my lord, like to a gentle prince to take or borrow what we best may spare, and not, like bond slaves, force it from our hands? Presumptuous traitors, that will we try on you. Will you set limits to the king's high pleasure? Away to prison, seize their goods and lands. Much good may it do ye, my lord. The care is tain. As good die there, as here abroad be slain. Well, God forgive both you and us, my lord. Your hard oppressions have undone the state and made all England poor and desolate. Why suffer ye their speech? To prison high, there let them perish, rot, consume, and die. Exit officers with the shreves. Art thou there, Nimble? I am here, my lord, and since your lordship is now employed to punish traitors, I am come to present myself unto you. What, for a traitor? No, my lord, but for a discoverer of the strangest traitor that was ever heard of. For my plane arithmetic of my capacity, by plane arithmetic of my capacity, I have found out the very words a traitor spoke that has whistled treason. How is that? Whistle treason? Most certain, my lord. I have a trick for it. If a car man do but whistle, I'll find treason, I warrant ye. Oh, thou art a rare statesman, Nimble. Thou'st a reaching head. I'll put treason into any man's head, my lord. Let him answer it as he can. And then, my lord, we have got a schoolmaster that teaches all the country to sing treason. And like a villain, he says, God bless your lordship. Thou art a most strange discoverer. Where are these traitors? All in prison, my lord. Master Ignorance, the Bailey of Dunstable, and I have taken great pains about them. Besides, here's a note of 700 whisperers, most of them sleepy knaves, we pulled out of Bedfordshire. Let's see the note. 700 whispering traitors. Oh, monstrous villains. We must look to these. Of all the sort, these are the most dangerous to stir rebellion against the king and us. What are they, Crosby? Are the rebels wealthy? Fat chuffs, my lord. All landed men. Rich farmers, graziers, and such fellows that having been as a little pinched with imprisonment, begin already to offer their lands for liberty. Alex, do you want to take your part back, my love? Oh, okay, right. We'll not be nice to take their officers, Crosby. Their lands are better than our lives to us, and without their lands they shall not ransom lives. Go, sirs, to terrify the traitors more. You shall have warrants straight to hang them all. Then, if they proffer lands and put in bail to make a just surrender speedily, let them have lives and after liberty. But those that have nor lands nor goods to pay, let them be whipped, then hanged. Make haste away. Well, then, I see my whistler must be whipped. He has but two calves to live on, and has lost them too. And for my schoolmaster, I'll have him march about the marketplace with ten dozens of rods at girdle, the, at skirdle, the very day he goes a-feasting, and every one of his scholars shall have a jerk at him. Come, sirs. Away and leave us. And exit Nimble and the rest. We'll pause there. Hello back, Alexandra. 
Hello. Um, I don't know what happened there, but as soon as I started speaking, the internet decided it doesn't like me anymore. Oh. Okay. Well, you can you can resume as Tresillian in 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 a moment. Let's just thank have a little you, talk. You, There's a bit of a callback here in this scene. Um, <laughs> to uh, to uh, one we had earlier in in the play. Thoughts about um where this has taken that uh, that scene and the, the, the progression of what's going on with Tresillian and Nimble. I'm sure someone has, uh, some of the room have some thoughts on that. Well, Paul Whistler. I mean, the, the, the landed people get off and, and the, the poor man with his lost his calves, he's, lost, he's gonna lost, lose his life as well, along with the schoolmaster. Well, the schoolmaster's not gonna have a very good time of it either. And the, the sheriffs, <laughs> and the sheriffs from Kent and Northumberland are, uh, Tresillian is riding roughshod over their um, charter rights and everything else. They're, mm. they're, uh, I think it was only the sink ports in Kent that had the discharge from taxes, but nevertheless, um, they're, they, 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 the thing is, what they're saying is this is unconstitutional mm. it's interesting um you were saying yesterday robert about the the comedy and the darkness being balanced on a knife edge in these scenes where they're discussing um you know and we're actually seeing the effect on the common people um there seems to have been a shift now before the comedy and the darkness were were kind of quite skillfully evenly matched and now we seem to be shifting more into the dark there's still comic moments but we're beginning to see the effects of uh of what's happening you know we're going back up the chain aren't we mm. uh and the higher we go up the chain and the more power comes into it and the more politics comes into it the more uh it, it leaves a a nasty taste behind it. Yes, this is this is we're back up at the people at the top uh, dispensing uh, injustice, um, uh, uh, and and uh, you know it's not like the other, which was a sort of parade of semi-comic characters. This mm. this is not at all, Tamara. Well, I find it interesting because initially in that first scene, and I really like Nimble as horrible as he is. Um, in that first scene with Tresillian and Nimble, I fully expected him to turn on Tresillian. Yeah, um, me too. And now he's just having the time of his life being a member of the Spanish Inquisition, almost. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, just seems to be very loyal to Tresillian, mm. which, um, yeah, I was kind of... I don't know, a bit disappointed. I, I disappointed felt the same. and nimble. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I felt the same actually, because I, I haven't read ahead and I, I felt exactly the same as Tamara. When they started at the beginning of the play, I thought, oh, there's going to be trouble there um, with him being the, you know, at the school with him and then not rising as high. There's going to be some argy bargy. But you're right, he's just kind of slotted right in, hasn't he? And, and become the loyal sidekick. Mm. Mm. But the play itself does not mock the common people, which is a little unusual because normally plays of this uh, period were, they found anybody, alderman, sheriff downwards, even the Lord Mayor of London could be safely mocked and should be safely mocked. Whereas apart from poor old ignorance, who uh, and his pestiferousness, um, there isn't really any mocking. No, the, it was interesting because I did try uh, uh, forcing a, a sort of comedy rustic accent on, on uh, the part I read, and it, it's not there. Uh, no. They're not doing comedy yokels uh, at all. Um, and... Um, the, the kind of satire I think we can say that ignorance is about is not about uh, is 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 not that kind of comedy, is it? It's uh, it's um, it's there's a bit of wordplay, but his 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 pomposity is is interesting. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the the it's it's is very even handed with people uh, apart from the king, who the play doesn't seem to like very much at all. Uh, <laughs> what what is funny is the names they get called, like sheep bites. 
Biter and Ox Jaw Breaker or something. They're the various names that they, they get given. That's quite funny, but uh, otherwise, no. Any additional thoughts at this stage? Otherwise, we'll cr crash on to the rest of the scene. Uh, finish the scene off. So, Tresillian is left alone briefly, um, but only in so much as the uh, rotating door of action swings round and enters Bagot. So, Tresillian, uh, back with Alexandra where it belongs. So, here, here comes, comes. Yeah. Bagot. Right happily met, my Lord Tresillian. You're well returned to court, Sir Edward, to this sad house of Sheen, made comfortless by the sharp sickness of the good Queen Anne. King Richard's come and gone to visit her, said for a weak estate he sits and weeps. Her speech is gone, only at sight of him she heaved her hands and closed her eyes again, and whether alive or dead is yet uncertain. And enter Bushy. <clears throat> Here comes Sir William Bushy. What tidings, sir? The king's a widower, sir. Fa fair Anne Abeam has breathed her last farewell to all the realm. Peace with her soul. She was a virtuous lady. How takes King Richard this, her sudden death? Uh, fares like a madman. Rends his princely hair. Beats his sad breast falls groveling on the earth, all careless of his state, wishing to die, and even in death to keep her company. But that which makes his soul more desperate, amidst this heat of passion, weeping, comes his aunt, the Duchess, Woodstock's hapless wife, with tender love and comfort, at sight of whom his griefs again redoubled, calling to mind the lady's woeful state, as yet all ignorant of her own mishap. He takes her in his arms, weeps on her breast, and would have there revealed her husband's fall amidst his passions, had not Scroop and Green by violence borne him to an inward room, where still he cries to get a messenger to send to Calais to reprieve his uncle. I do not like those passions. If you reveal the plot, we all shall perish. Where is the Duchess? With much ado, we got her to leave the presence with an intent in haste to ride to Plashy. She'll find sad comforts there. Would all were well, a thousand dangers round enclose our state. And we'll break through, my lord, in spite of fate. Come, come, be merry, good Tresillian. Here comes King Richard, all go comfort him. And enter King Richard with him, Scroop. My dearest lord, forsake these sad laments. No sorrows can suffice to make her live. Then let sad sorrow kill King Richard too. For all earthly joys with her must die, and I am killed with cares eternally. For Anna Beam is dead, forever gone. She was too virtuous to remain with me, and heaven hath given her higher dignity. Oh God, I fear. Even here begins our woe, her deaths but chorus to some tragic scene that shortly will confound our state and realm. Such sad events black mischief will attend, and bloody acts, I fear, must crown the end. Presage not, sweet prince, your state is strong, your youthful hopes with expectations crowned. Let not one loss so many comforts drown. Despair and madness seize me. Oh, my dear friends, what loss can be compared to such a queen? Down with this house of sheen, go, ruin all. Pull down her buildings, let her turrets fall, forever lay it waste and desolate, that English king may never here keep court. But to all ages leave a sad report, when men shall see these ruined walls of sheen, and sighing say, here died King Richard's queen, for which we'll have it wasted lime and stone, to keep a monument of Richard's moan. Oh, torturing grief. Oh, my dear liege, all tears for her are vain oblations. 
her quiet soul rests in celestial peace. With joy of that, let all your sorrows cease. Send post to Calais and bid Lapool forbear on pain of life to add, act our sad decree. For heaven's love, go, prevent the tragedy. Oh, we have too much provoked the powers divine and here repent thy wrongs, good uncle Woodstock. The thought whereof confounds my memory. If men might die when they would point the time, the time is now, King Richard would be gone. For as a fearful thunderclap doth strike the soundest body of the tallest oak, yet harmless leaves the outward bark untouched, so is King Richard struck. Come, come, let's go. My wounds are inward, inward burn my woe. And they exit, and that ends the act. So, um, lots of interesting things here. Uh, just a note on the sort of structural sense of what this play does. Um, it sets up an idea or uh, something, and then it always demonstrates it. So there's always a set up in the dialogue and then the inaction. So they say the king is acting like a madman and you, uh, you know, a few speeches later, then he enters. And it's, it, it, it really is a, a very neat and uh, tidy way of making sure that we know, we're following this clearly because it's giving you both visual and, uh, and also textual um, support. And I, I, I really do like that, that this is a very well structured play in that sense. Thoughts about what happened in that scene? It's Hello. lovely the way Tresillian introduces these people just in case we've forgotten which of the favourites is which. Mm -hmm. Here comes Sir Edward Baggett and then here comes Sir William Bushy. Mm. It's, it's lovely. And they don't sit, I'm not sure that they always have all the minions on at the same time. So it's like you, you do get a bit of a chance to... To, to take them in individually rather than as one amorphous blob. Yes, um, definitely. You know, uh, well, that's wish, interesting. Sorry, yes. Oh, wish, is the, wish is the geek, like, <laughs> who's in the library. Baggett's, yeah. Baggett's the bully boy. He's the one I've noticed who's a, he's a bit more, more aggressive. And then Green's the... He, pl the he, pluff it, he's, he pl um, pluffs up the, the pillows. Um, his, uh, he's the his, favourite. Green's yeah. the favourite, yeah, the handsome, pretty boy. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, so he, he, of course, reacts to grief in a perfectly rational and straightforward way. Um, I mean, uh, who would? I, 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 doesn't everyone knock down a castle? I mean, yeah. that's... <laughs> well, I, I'm just throwing us Whatever. back to Tamerlane uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, mm. <laughs> Burning, burning whole towns. Mm. <laughs> um, no, whatever he does, he does it more. Mm, yeah. Uh, Alexandra. I was going to say, here's an interesting development. Um, people are serving each other all of a sudden. Mm. So now that uh, we were talking yesterday about the, the difference in status between Tresillian and the four um, favourites who get basically handed the kingdom. And after that scene in which Tresillian is instrumental in putting together the papers that allow them to, to, to do that, um, now he introduces them as Sir First Name, Last Name, mm. and they address each other as, uh, and this happens I think with both of them, um, he addresses them as Sir, and they either respond with Sir or My Lord, mm. which is a, a major change from what we were talking about yesterday, where the, the favourites were um, almost seeming to try and put Tresillian down or, or sort of show him that he's below them. Mm. Um, the play is really interested mm. in shifting statuses. Um, you know, the, the, the king shifting status at the beginning. Uh, what's happening with the uncles, their shifting status, the minions underneath, everybody in the social order underneath that, having the, the rug pulled from under them. It, it's a it's a really good starting point for any production in terms of workshopping with actors is to just start with status work because and, and you know uh, that's probably true of any uh, any play with uh, with with monarchs in um, but with with this it feels very, very fruitful. 
Other thoughts from the room? I, I just wondered whether, um, how seriously one can take Richard's um, speech there. You know, it, it almost struck me we were back to the over-emotional teenager that we commented on in the first act. Mm. Yes, I don't think he's changed. Mm. And, and given, given the marriage with Anna Bean was not a love match, or was not portrayed as a love match. They, they, they don't seem to be very close in the play. Um... He is, we were talking the other day about how he feels everything very intensely. I mean, I think he is genuine in his emotion because otherwise he wouldn't be talking about sending off to Calais. I mean, he must have been moved in some way, unless the whole Calais thing is a ruse as well. But I mean, actions speak louder than words and the fact that he actually orders someone to go to Calais and stop the, you know, the plot against his uncle, that suggests to me that he has been genuinely moved. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, over emotional, yes, but I didn't get the vibe that he was, he was lying or staging this in some way. Mm. Mm. I, I, I think there's an interesting question of fear here. You know, he suddenly yeah. has this presage of doom, which, you know, has been, there's been a touch of the dooms all over uh, the last act. Um, or in fact, this act, this act has had lots of presaging of disaster. Um, and it's like Richard has that presage. Well, maybe if I, I, I can change the direction of everything, everything will be fine. Because, you know, he must be getting some sense that the kingdom could possibly be about to fall into open revolt as well you know he's he's um so it 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 is rational as well as emotional um if if we sort of couch it that way it also is the big get out isn't it so that richard isn't directly responsible anymore for the death of thomas if indeed he dies well the the thought i had on that was um is is this a little bit too late um you know oh well, we never got the email sir mm. <laughs> Which say, dramatically I, is is a common and a very effective tool. Yeah. You know, so what whatever we might think of it in a in terms of a of a historical context, in a in a performative sense, it works really well for us as an audience to go, There's hope. No, actually, wait, hang on. <laughs> um also, um the the tearing down of Sheen um is historical. Mm. So it's not an exaggeration. It's, no. a, it's a it's a reference to the chronicle again. Mm. Um, and and yeah, the, the that thing of remorse as well. I mean, Richard has not actually killed anyone yet, has he? As a king, you know, he's he's robbed mm. a lot of people, and okay, yeah. maybe some common people have, have died horribly. Oh, um, they don't count. But they don't count. It's it's not like this is he's actually organising, uh, you know, an abduction and things. So maybe there's there is mixed in with that, you know, just genuine remorse of you know he's his uncle. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say more than the fact that, you know, no named important characters have died yet um, of status. It's, mm. it's um, family. Mm. And significant that she is the one, like we were saying yesterday, she's the one good person. And she's the one who dies. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I did want to say earlier, but she really is set up as a sort of martyr figure, um, mm. you know, uh, all, uh, from, from, from quite early on. Um, any additional thoughts? Otherwise, I need to, we need to crack on into Act 5. OK, let's move on as things get a bit darker, shall we say. I think that's clearly indicated by the, uh, the opening stage directions, which is um, uh, enter Le Poule with a light and after him... Two murderers. <laughs> <clears throat> Come, sirs, be resolute. The time serves well to act the business you have ta'en in hand. The Duke is gone to rest. Be fearless, bold, and win King Richard's love with heaps of gold. Are all your instruments for death made ready? All fit to the purpose. See, my lord, here's first a towel with which we do intend to strangle him. But if he strive and this should chance to fail, I'll maul his old mazard with this hammer, knock him down like an ox, and after cuts throat. How like ye this? No, wound him not. It must be done so fair and cunningly, as if he died a common, natural death. For so we must give out to all that ask. There is no way then but to smother him. I like that best. 
Yet one thing let me tell ye, think not your work contrived so easily as if you were to match some common man. Believe me, sirs, his countenance is such, so full of dread and lordly majesty, mixed with such mild and gentle haviour, as will, except you be resolved at full, strike you with fear, even with his princely looks. Not and he looked as grim as Hercules, as stern and terrible as the devil himself. Tis well resolved. Retire yourselves a while, and when occasion serves, I'll call you forth. Do but beckon with your finger, my lord, and like vultures we come flying and seize him presently. And exit the two murderers. Do so. Now, by my fairest hopes, I swear the boldness of these villains to this murder makes me abhor them and the deed forever. Horror of conscience, with the king's command fights a fell combat in my fearful breast. The king commands his uncle here must die, and my said conscience bids the contrary and tells me that his innocent blood thus spilt, heaven will revenge. Oh, murder's a heinous guilt, a seven times crying sin. Oh, a cursed man, the further that I wade in this foul act, my troubled senses are the more distract, confounded and tormented past my reason. But there's no lingering. Either he must die, or great King Richard vows my tragedy. Then twixt two evils, is good to choose the least. Let danger fright fate fools. I'll save mine own, and let him fall to black destruction. He draws the curtains and discovers Woodstock in bed. He sleeps upon his bed. The time serves fitly. I'll call the murderers in. Sound music there to rock his senses in eternal slumbers. Sleep, Woodstock, sleep. Thou never more shalt wake. This town of Calais shall forever tell, within her castle walls, playing Thomas fell. Exit the pool, and there is thunder and lightning, and enter the ghost of the Black Prince. Night, horror, and the eternal shrieks of death intended to be done this dismal night hath shook fair England's great cathedral, and from my tomb elate at Canterbury, the ghost of Edward, the Black Prince, is come to stay King Richard's rage, my wanton son. Thomas of Woodstock, wake, thy brother calls thee. Thou royal issue of King Edward's loins, thou art beset with murder, rise and fly. If here thou stay, death comes, and thou must die. Still doth thou sleep. Oh, I am naught but air. Had I the vigour of my former strength, when thou beheldst me fight at Cressy Field, where hand to hand I took King John of France and his bold sons, my captive prisoners, I'd shake these stiff supporters of thy bed and drag thee from this dull security. Oh, yet for pity, wake, prevent thy doom. Thy blood upon my son will surely come, for which, dear brother Woodstock, haste and fly. Prevent his ruin and thy tragedy. Exit the ghost, more thunder, and enter Edward the Third's ghost. Sleep'st thou so soundly and pale, death so nigh, Thomas of Woodstock, wake, my son, and fly. Thy wrongs have roused thy royal father's ghost, and from his quiet grave King Edward's come to guard thy innocent life. My princely son, behold me here. Sometimes, fair England's lord, seven warlike sons I left, yet being gone, no one succeeded my kingly throne. Richard of Bordeaux, my accursed grandchild, cut off your titles to the kingly state, and now your, li your lives and all would ruinate. 
murders his grandsire's son, his father's brothers, becomes a landlord of my kingly titles, rents out my crown's revenue, racks my subjects that spent their blood with me in conquering France, beheld me ride in state throughout London streets, and at my stirrup lowly footing by, four captive kings to grace my victory. Yet that, not this, his riotous youth can stay, till death hath taken his uncles all away. Thou fifth of Edward's sons, get up and fly. Hasty to England, close and speedily. Thy brothers York and Gaunt are up in arms. Go join with them, prevent thy further harms. The murderers are at end, awake my son. This hour foretells thy sad destruction. And exit the ghost. O oh, good angels, guide me. Stay, thou blessed spirit, thou royal shadow of my kingly father. Return again. I know thy reverend looks. With thy dear sight once more recomfort me, put by the fears my trembling heart foretells. And here is made apparent to my sight by dreams and visions of this dreadful night. Upon my knees I beg it. <laughs> Protect me, heaven. The doors are all made fast. Twas but my fancy. All's whist, wished and still, and nothing here appears but the vast circuit of this empty room. Thou blessed hand of mercy, guide my senses. Afore my God, methought as here I slept, I did behold in lively form and substance my father Edward and my warlike brother, both gliding by my bed, and cried to me to leave this place to save my life and fly. Lighten my fears, dear Lord. I here remain a poor old man, thrust from my native country, kept imprisoned in a foreign kingdom. And uh, enter the pool of murderers uh, somewhere in the background. If I must, I bear record, righteous heaven, how I have nightly waked for England's good, and yet to right her wrongs would spend my blood. Send they sad doom, King Richard, take my life. I wish my death might ease my country's grief. We are prevented. Back! Retire again. He's risen from his bed. What fate preserves him? And Lepool is left on stage as the ex murderer's exit. My lord, I'll fare you. Thou canst not kill me, villain. God's holy angels guard a just man's life, and with his radiant beams as bright as fire will guard and keep his righteous innocence. I am a prince. Thou darest not murder me. Your grace mistakes, my lord. What art thou? Speak. Lapool, my lord, this city's governor. Lapool, thou art King Richard's flatterer. Oh, you just gods, record their treachery. Judge their foul wrongs that under show of friendship betrayed my simple kind intendiment. My heart misgave it was no time for revels when you, like maskers, came disguised to Plashy, joined the wanton king to trap my life. For that I nosed the end his malice aims at. This castle and my secret sending hither imports no less. Therefore, I charge ye, tell me, even by the virtue of nobility, and partly too on that allegiance thou owest to the offspring of King Edward's house, if thou, if aught thou knowest to prejudice my life, thou presently reveal and make it known. Nay, my good lord, forbear that fond suspicion. I tell thee, Poole, there is no less intended. Why am I sent thus from my native country, but here at Calais to be murdered? And that, Le Poole, confounds my patience. This town of Calais, where I spent my blood to make it captive to the English king, before whose walls great Edward lay encamped with his seven sons almost for fourteen months, where the black prince, my brother, 
and my wife, the peers of England and our royal father, fearless of wounds, ne'er left till it was won, and was to make a prison for his son? Oh, righteous heavens, why do you suffer it? Uh, disquiet not your thoughts, my gracious lord. There is no hurt intended. Credit me. Although a while your freedom be abridged, I know the king. If you would but submit and write your letters to his majesty, your reconcilement might be easily wrought. For what should I submit or ask his mercy? Had I offended, with all low submission, I'd lay my neck under the block before him and willingly endure the stroke of death. But if not so, why should my fond entreaties make my true loyalty appear like treason? No, no, Lepoule. Let guilt men beg pardons. My mind is clear. And I must tell ye, sir, princes have hearts like pointed diamonds that will in sunder burst afore they bend. And such lives, and such lives here, though deaf King Richard sends. Yet fetch me pen and ink. I'll write to him, not to entreat, but to admonish him that he forsake his foolish ways in time and learn to govern like a virtuous prince. Call home his wise and reverent counsellors. Thrust from his court those cursed flatterers that hourly works the realm's confusion. This counsel, if he follow, may in time pull down those mischiefs that so fast do climb. Here's pen and paper, my lord. Wilt please write ye write? Anon, I will. Shut to the doors and leave me. Good night, Lepoule. And pardon me, I prithee that my sad fear made question of thy faith. My state is fearful and my mind was troubled even at thy entrance with most fearful visions which made my passions more extreme and hasty. Out of my better judgments I repent it and will reward thy love. Once more, good night. Good rest unto your grace. My mean in death this dismal night. Thou breathest thy latest breath. He sits to write. I'll call the murderers in to steal behind and closely strangle him. And exit the pool. So help me heaven, I know not what to write, what style to use, nor how I should begin. My method is too plain to greet a king. It's nothing say to excuse or clear myself, for I have done nothing that needs excuse. But tell him plain, though here I spend my blood, I wish his safety and all England's good. And we'll pause there at the entrance of the murderers. I thought that, that felt like a, a, a reasonable point. Uh, it's quite a long scene. Um, lots of things going on. Uh, one quite random thought. Is this uh, plot development news by ghost? Um, have we had a mention that York and Gaunt are up in arms anywhere else in the play yet? I mean, they said they're going to. Has anyone actually said... So at the moment, it looks like Edward III is, is, is more up on current events from beyond the grave. I mean, you would be, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, 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 that just leapt out at me, and I don't know if it's just simply I missed something earlier. Um, but it, it, it's interesting, just hiding exposition in something completely different. Um, I, I think that's, that's really, that's actually really very clever. Um, thoughts about what we've witnessed? It's obviously there's still a bit more of this scene to go. It's a little rough if your grandfather and your father are both saying you're unfit to rule. I mean, various people have said things about the wanton king that, I mean, this is, this is tough. It's, it's telling the wrong person, though. It. Yeah, exactly. yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a much nastier and more intense condemnation of Richard as a king than any we've had yet. Mm. Mm. And it's even more rougher coming from who it does. Mm. Yes, you know, these, these great uh, national heroes of, you know, of the wars in France and, and their, their, their stature. Um, clearly is so completely different to the, 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 the son and grandson. Um, other thoughts? I find Le Poole a really interesting character. 
actually, because um, in other plays, quite often the, uh, the, the figure who's in charge of not necessarily doing the murder, but in charge of, of ordering it, it you, you know, they, they are out and out baddies. Um, and it, I didn't play him at like that just because I felt just from what I was getting from the speeches, he's clearly really conflicted. He has, he has the uh, conflict going on within him that you'd normally associate with a more major character. Um, so I just find that really interesting. Um, you know, he's come into the play late, he's not a major character, and yet he's been given this quite complex, um, you know, part in that he, he really wants to obviously follow the king's orders, save his own neck and, you know, do as he's told. But on the other hand, he clearly feels for Woodstock and um, doesn't really want to order his murder. I, think. Well, I mean, it's, 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 you know, clearly contrasted with the murderers who are, you know, very much, mm. well, if you want him killed, well, we can do it lots of ways. We've got, uh, here's, here's the list. Um, you know, they've, they've got the, the repertoire down pat. Um, whereas Lapool is a character who, you know, is going to talk to people. And um, I, I, I don't know how conflicted he is. Um, I mean, it's because, you know, it's a, it's a big thing killing this chap. Um, it's not your common and garden murderer. Um, so I think the trepidation there, I'm not sure. I, I, I felt the trepidation was much more about just, you know, we've got to get this right. We've got to make sure the murder is carried off correctly. Damn, he's awake. Uh, so much easier to kill people in their sleep. Um, and, and, and that. Um, other, other thoughts in the room? Yes, it can. Uh, murder like that can always come back and bite you when somebody needs a scapegoat. Yeah. But what is interesting is that the the early modern theatrical murder, if one can so characterise them, of, of of prominent people, very rarely seems to be um, off the cuff. There are usually massive presentiments, ghosts, sometimes dreams. I mean, these these things don't happen casually mm, mm. you know right. I and mean, you need you need a, a good big scene leading up to it mm. we've had a lot of press we well we've effectively had act four as a run-up uh, alexandra um i really like the payoff of um one line really early on i think it was in in act two scene one that um Richard said to another of his uncles, if my father and my grandfather could see how you're treating me, they'd come back mm. and haunt you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I love what that has now led to because they do come back, uh, you know, as, as ghosts. So yay. But also as with so many other parts of this play, what was set, what we were told was going to happen is exactly the opposite of what ends up happening. Mm. Mm. You know, they come back not to haunt uh, Woodstock to to um, uh, chastise him. They come to say, Richard's a terrible king and we both agree. Yeah, get other. out, get out. Yeah, survive. Um, it's yes. interesting though, isn't it? They're like, they're more like Jedi force ghosts than, <laughs> you know, because they appear to the good guy, Woodstock, rather than actually turn around to their son and grandson and go, dude. Our, our history would have been so different if they just turned to Richard and gone, dude, man, what are you doing? Yeah, uh, yeah and, and it's Woodstock. I mean, he, again, he's, you know, speaking his mind. Um, he's, um, you know, is that thing you can't, kill, you know, he, there, there, there's a lot of pride as well as fear in, in, in him here. And, you know, that we were talking about how he just can't help but say, what's uppermost in his thoughts. Um, any thoughts about Woodstock before we move on? Because the, there's, there's still more to the scene to come. Well, it's interesting you just said that because in his, the last thing he says, I'll tell him plain. Even, even then with a, with a, a knife to his, uh, over his head type of thing. Uh, he's still, he'll, he's true to himself right to the very end. Mm. Mm. Okay, well then, I think it's time to re-enter the murderers. So, uh, Lapool has uh, had a hasty exit. Woodstock is left uh, putatively writing a letter and uh, enter both murderers.
Creep close to his back, you rogue. Be ready with the towel when I have knocked him down to strangle him. Do it quickly while his back is towards ye, ye damned villain. If thou lets him speak but a word, we shall not kill him. I'll watch him for that. Down on your knees and creep, you rascal. Have mercy, God. My sight all of a sudden fails me. I cannot see my paper. My trembling fingers will not hold my pen. Thick, congealed mist o'erspreads the chamber. I'll rise and view the room. No, too fast for falling. And strikes him. What villain hand hath done a deed so bad to drench his black soul in a prince's blood? Do ye prate, sir? Take that and that! Zoons, put the towel about his throat and strangle him quickly, ye slave, or by the heart of hell I'll fell thee too. It is done, ye damned slave, pull ye dog, and pull thy soul to hell in doing it. For thou hast killed the truest subject that ever breathed in England. Pull, rogue, pull. Think of the gold we shall have for doing it. And then let him and thee go to the devil together. Bring in the feather bed and roll him up in that. Till he be smothered and stifled and life and soul pressed out together. Quickly, ye hellhound. Here, here, ye cannibal. Sounds. He kicks and sprawls. Lies on his breast, ye villain. Let him sprawl and hang. He's sure enough for speaking. Pull off the bed now. Smooth down his hair and beard, close his eyes, and set his neck right. Why, so, all fine and cleanly. Who can say that this man was where I murdered now? I'm just going to pause here because that murder went well. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a mixture of comedy and tragedy because it's that, that sense of bungling um, from the murderers because they do it clearly so badly. There's blood everywhere from the dialogue um, uh, and you know they're creeping on their hands and knees while to Woodstock is doing his his uh, you know the blackness and the root and you know that that and then it I mean it should be really horrible and drawn out this I think mm. well, that seems to be my first instinct um, mm. this isn't a quick murder this is just it keeps going wrong and it needs to again balance on that knife edge between being a bit comic but also just horrid um and you know uh staging murders it, it, I, i've done a few in my time and you know uh, suffocation takes a long time um and if you're you know you're, you're doing it in any kind of realistic naturalism and you know they're using the bed they're using the, all this stuff it's just god i mean it, it it would actually require a lot of choreography to get this right mm. yeah and Right in the middle of it, the second murderer says, Pull thy soul to hell in doing it, for thou hast killed the truest subject that ever breathed in England. Yes, I mean, sudden, sudden, sudden murderer oh, remorse syndrome. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, and it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's almost Arthurian, you know, the truest knight that ever... Hmm. How comic it is depends on... on how much of a fight he puts up, doesn't it? I mean, mm. he, we've just had a couple of ghosts reminding us of the the noble line of warriors that he comes from. Mm. And mm. so, um, you know, we might have been thinking of him as this kind of you know, doddery old guy, I suppose, but he might not be. Mm. He might just be older than these, but he might be, you know, the reason it's taking so long could be not that they're inept, but that he's putting up a hell of a fight because he is who he is. He's not some kind of, uh, the, the reason he's been giving this counsel is not necessarily because he's, uh, he's weak. Um, he's a man of peace, but he's, he's a warrior as well. So that's an alternative to that. Mm. That, that yeah. could be the, the stretching of it out is precisely to kind of uh, uh, show we what shows what we've lost as an audience. Mm. Mm. Uh, I agree with that because it, they use pull four times. I think you really get the impression they're really he's they're trying to strangle him, and it's not it's not easily done. Mm. I didn't find it very comic at all. Actually, I found it quite edge of the seatish. 
Well, I, 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 what I'm saying is, it's, it's comic. You've got it, yeah. the the, the dial. The, there is it, it's it's not comic in the sense that it's, I, mm. I think it is. I don't think it's supposed to be funny. I think that the the the, the way it's structured, it, it 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 reads almost like a farce. Yeah, it is deadly serious, and that mm. makes it actually gives it the edge of uh, of of horror. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, the murder is a bloody terrible thing. And I think this, this scene really lays it out. It's not some nice quick stab, oh, they're dead. Mm -hmm. um, this is a drawn out affair. Mm. Um, but we're gonna have to move forward because um, the question of uh, comedy uh, comes up with how deadpan uh, LaPool says the next line, now the deed is done. <laughs> if the deed is in fact done, because at no point does the script say when Woodstock dies. Except you know, set his neck right. Oh, that's horrible. Mm. Mm. So enter Le Poul. What? Is he dead? As a doornail, my lord. What will you do with his body? Take it up. Gently lay him in his bed, then shut the door as <coughs> if he there had died. It cannot be perceived otherwise, my lord. Never was murder done with such rare skill. At our return, we shall expect a reward, my lord. Tis ready told. Bear in the body, then return and take it. And uh, uh, exit the, uh, the, uh, the murderers with the body. Within there. Ho! And enter oh. soldiers. My lord. Be ready with your weapons. Guard the room. There's two false traitors entered the Duke's chamber, plotting to bear him thence, betray the castle, deliver up the town and all our lives to the French forces that are hard at hand to second their attempts. Therefore, stand close, and as they enter, seize them presently. Our wills your warrant, use no further words, but hew them straight to pieces with your swords. I warrant ye, my lord. And their skins were scaled with brass. We have swords, we'll pierce them. Come, sirs, be ready. Enter the murderers. Come, you Mitch and rascal. The deed's done and all things performed rarely. We'll take our reward, steal close out of the town, buy us fresh gelding, spur, cut and ride till we're past all danger. I warrant thee. Give their reward there, quick I say. Down with the traitors, kill the villains. Hell and the and devil, the devil sounds, hold ye rascals. rascals! And they kill the murderers. Drag hence their bodies, hurl them in the sea. The black reward of deaths a traitor's pay. And exit the soldiers with their bodies. Neat. So, this was well performed. Now who but we can make report of Woodstock's tragedy? Only he died a natural death at Calais. So must we give it out, or else King Richard, through Europe's kingdoms, will be hardly censured. His headstrong uncles, York and Lancaster, are up, we hear, in open arms against him. The gentlemen and commons of the realm, missing the good old duke, their plain protector, break their allegiance to their sovereign lord, and all revolt upon the baron's sides. To help which harm, I'll o'er to England straight, and with the old troops of soldiers ta'en from Calais, I'll back King Richard's power. For should he fail, and his great uncles get the victory, his friends are sure to die. But if he win, they fall, and we shall rise whilst Richard's king. And he exits. Uh, just should note that the manuscript does have some uh, of that uh, struck out, uh, in fact, uh, including the bit where the bodies exit, uh, the soldiers exit with the bodies. So when actually uh, whoever said neat, um, uh, potentially this is where the bodies get dragged out because uh, that the bit where that happens might uh, might uh, not have been there in 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 different versions. It's um, a question of what happened to the manuscript is perhaps something we'll talk about later. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like they've been hired because they're not very good, because they, they need them to be dead and blamed um, for the murder itself. You know, it's this, uh, the, again, plausible deniability uh, element. Um, well, only blamed if the, it's discovered to be a murder. Yeah. But they have to be not available to say it was a murder. Mm. 
And also the, the way it's presented to the soldiers is that they haven't come to, to do him harm. They've come to um, take him, to release him, basically, to, to steal him away. Mm. In league with the dreaded French. Mm. <laughs> Constantly Always. trying to get Calais. Yes, Calais. So Yes, um, and yes, we well we had that mention of uh, Woodstock earlier, saying you know the, the irony of him being taken to Calais, somewhere that he had you know helped to uh, to, to to hold for the English. Um, so that was a cheerful scene. Mm -hmm. That's that's it for Woodstock. We're not going to see him again. I'm guessing my uh, <laughs> yeah. My reading of Le Pool was totally wrong then. He wasn't really conflicted. <laughs> no, I, I think it, 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 it was, it, yeah, I, I, I don't think, I think there's, some, there's definitely thoughts going on in his head, but, um, you know, it, it was, it's a tricky business, his job. I, I think he would rely on the Nuremberg defence. Mm. Yes. I was only obeying orders. Yes, so the, uh, he is gone um and so we are nipping back to england next so um we have had intimations of uh, york and lancaster have been busy in everybody's absence so a uh, drums march within enter tresillian and nimble with armor tresillian with armor. And half asleep. These proclamations we have sent abroad, wherein we have accused the dukes of treason, will dent their pride and make the people leave them. I hope no less, at least. Where art thou, nimble? So loaded with armor I cannot stir, my lord. Whose drums are those that beat even now? King Richard's drums, my lord, the young lords of pressing soldiers. Oh, and do they take their press with willingness? As willing as a punk that's pressed on a feather bed. They take their pressing a piece with great patience. Marry the lords, no sooner turn their backs, but they run away like sheep, sir. They shall be hanged like dogs for it. What dares the slave refuse the so their sovereign? They say the proclamation's false, my lord, and they'll not fight against the king's friends. So I feared as much, and since tis come to this, I must provide be time and seek for safety. For now the king and our audacious peers are grown to such height of burning rage as nothing now can quench their kindled ire, but open trial by the sword and lance. And then I fear King Richard's part will fail. Nimble. Our soldiers run, thou sayest. Aye, by my troth, my lord. And I think uh, tis our best course to run after them. For if they run now, what will they do when the battle begins? If we tarry here, the king's uncles catch us. We are sure to be hanged, my lord. Have you no trick of law to defend us? No, no demure or writ of error to remove us? Nimble, we must be wise. Then let's not stay to have more wit beaten, uh, beaten into our heads. I like not that, my lord. For, of peace and not for war. And yet they say you have made more wrangling in the land than all the wars have done their seven years. This battle will revenge their base exclaims. But here's thou nimble. I'll not be there today. One man amongst so many is no maim, therefore I'll keep aloof till all be done. If good, I stay. If bad, away I run. Nimble it shall be so. I'll neither fight nor die, but this resolved. Disguise myself and fly. Exit Tresillian. Tis the wisest cause, my lord, and I'll go put off mine armour that I may run lustily too. And exit Nimble. So... Um, it's a very efficient little scene that actually getting a very clear indication of what's going on in the uh, in Richard's camp is that when the going gets tough everybody <laughs> runs um, that everything falls apart remarkably quickly the army that they've got they don't want to fight um, they don't know who they're fighting they, they don't understand they don't want to get involved um, and yeah Tresillian's off um, Nimble with this sort of pile of armor. I, I'm assuming that's a sort of <laughs> comic uh, opening 
visual uh, that they're throwing at us. Um, quick, brief thoughts about this. It's quite yeah, a change. I think, I think I think Nimble is actually wearing the wearing far too much armor, and being unused to it is un finding it very difficult because he says, "I'll go and put off mine armor mm. that I may run lustily." So he's put on too many layers, and he's just sort of a Michelin Man style. Um, yeah, 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 he's he's yeah. he's overdone it. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like he raided the armory with everything he could get. Never mind <laughs> if it fits or not. Just lots of metal. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a really nice um, opportunity and a very concise way to see. Uh, well, for one thing, Tresillian and Nimble, who were lawyers and not soldiers, panicking because they're not soldiers um but um i as you were saying robert i think it's it's in microcosm it's a, an illustration of what is happening with everyone around king richard is that they're suddenly discovering we're not we're not we're for peace not for war we're really good at the whole you know underhand machinations thing but um yeah going out getting an armor and going out and fighting that's not us mm. Mm. Also, the the press, um, the, the the levy of troops has been failing mm. because they're unable to keep them once they've levied them mm. because they're all run they're all running away. Mm. Well, they're probably not willing to pay them for a start because uh, you know mm. why would they give up their money? Uh. <laughs> well, it, it it may be that, but it it it's also that. A lot of these people would be pressed, would be unwilling to be pressed. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it's not like there's a clear cut cause as to to to, to fight. Uh, you know, is there? You know, it's 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 a very odd uh, situation for everyone. I think you know, for the common person on the street. I mean, what you know, it's 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 not really to do with them. They might feel. Um, it's a lot to have to to put up with. They're the blank charters, and then they're being pressed, and it's a. Mm. It's a com total confusion. Yeah. Um, you know, you might want to be loyal to the king, but the king's being a bit of a git. So uh, where, where do you go? OK, that was a brief little scenette. Uh, let us power on into 5-3. And this is where we're returning to the uncles. We haven't seen the uncles for a while. Um, York, Lancaster, Arundel, Surrey, with the Duchess of Gloucester, we uh, presumably weeping. Uh, mm. And soldiers and uh, Cheney, there is drum and colours. It's uh, it's all going on on their side, um, and hopefully the doubling works. Go to our tents, dear sister. Cease your sorrows. We will revenge our noble brother's wrongs and force that wanton tyrant to reveal the death of his dear uncle, harmless Woodstock, so traitorously betrayed. Alack, good man, it was an easy task to work on him. His plainness was his plainness was too open to their view. He feared no wrong because his heart was true. Good sister, cease your weeping. There's none here but are as full of woe and touched as near. Conduct and guard her, Cheney, to the tent. Expect to hear severest punishment on all their heads that have procured his harms, struck from the terror of our threatening arms. May all the powers of heaven assist your hands, and may their sins sit heavy on their souls, that they in death this day may perish all that traitorously conspired good Woodstock's fall. And exit Cheney and the Duchess. If he be dead, by good King Edward's soul, we'll call King Richard to a strict account for that and for his realm's misgovernment. You peers of England, raised in righteous arms, here to re-edify our country's ruin. Join all your hearts and hands, never to cease, till with our swords we work fair England's peace. And there's the sound of drums. Most princely Lancaster. Our lands and lives are to these just proceedings ever vowed. Those flattering minions that o'erturn the state this day in death shall meet their endless fate. Never such vipers were endured so long to gripe and eat the hearts of all the kingdom. And there's another stage direction indicating drums. 
This day shall here determinate all wrongs. The meanest man taxed by their foul oppressions shall be permitted freely to accuse and right they shall have to regain their one or all shall sink in dark confusion. And the drowned of the sound of drums within continues. How now? What drums are these? And enter Cheney. To arms, my lords. The minions of the king are swiftly marching on to give ye battle. They march to death then, Cheney. Dare the traitors presume to brave the field with English princes? Where is King Richard? He was resolved but lately to take some hold of strength and so secure him. Knowing their states were all so desperate, it seems they had persuaded otherwise, for now he comes with full resolve to fight. Lapoule this morning is arrived at court with the Calais soldiers and some French supplies to back this now intended enterprise. Those new supplies have spurred their forward hopes and thrust their resolutions boldly on to meet with death and sad destruction. Their drums are near. Just heaven direct this deed, and as our cause deserves, our fortune speed. And they march about, enter with drum and colours, the king, uh, green, bushy, baggot, scroop, the pool, and soldiers, they march about all, uh, and here we may have people jumping between parts, uh, uh, do, uh, uh, hopefully it will work. Although we could have easily surprised, dispersed and overthrown your rebel troops that draw your swords against our sacred person, the highest God's anointed deputy, breaking your holy oaths to heaven and us, yet of our mild and princely clemency we have forborne, that by this parliament we might be made made partaker of this cause that moved ye rise in this rebellious sort. Hast thou, King Richard, made us infamous by proclamations false and impudent? Hast thou condemned us in our absence too as most notorious traitors to the crown? Betrayed our brother Woodstock's harmless life and sought base means to put us all to death? And dost thou now plead dotish ignorance why we are landed thus in our defence. Methinks your treasons to his majesty, raising his subjects against his royal life, should make ye beg for mercy at his feet. You have forgotten, Uncle Lancaster, how you in prison murdered cruelly a friar Carmelite, because he was to bring evidence against your grace of most ungracious deeds and practices. And you, my lord, remember not so well that by that Carmelite at London once, when at supper, you'd have poisoned us. For shame, King Richard, leave this company that like dark clouds obscure the sparkling stars of thy great birth and true nobility. Yield to your uncles, who but they should have the guidance of your sacred state and council. Yield first your heads, and so he shall be sure to keep his person and his state secure. And by my crown, if still you thus persist, your heads and hearts ere long shall answer it. Not till ye send for more supplies from France, for England will not yield ye strength to do it. Thou well mayst doubt their loves that lost their hearts, ungracious prince. Cannot thy native country find men to back this desperate enterprise? His native country? Why, that is France, my lords. At Bordeaux was he born, which place allures and ties his deep affections still to France. Richard is English blood, not English born. Thy mother travelled in unhappy hours when she at Bordeaux left her heavy load. The soil is fat for wines, not fit for men. And England now laments that heavy time. Her royalties are lost, her state made base. And thou no king but landlord now become to this great state that terrored Christendom. I cannot brook these braves, let drums sound death and strike at once to stop this traitor's breath. 
stay, my dear lord, and once more hear me, uh, princes. The king was minded ere this brawl begun to come to terms of composition. Let him revoke the proclamations, clear us of all supposed crimes of treason, reveal where our good brother Gloucester keeps, and grant that these pernicious flatterers may by the law be tried to quit themselves of all such heinous crimes alleged against them, and we'll lay down our weapons at thy feet. Presumptuous Sumptuous traitors! Traitors! traitors. traitors. Again! We'll double it. Rebellious traitors. Traitors to heaven and to us. Draw all your swords and fling defiance to these traitorous lords. Let drums thunder and thunder begin, begin the, the fight. fight. Just, Just heaven, heaven to protect, protect us, us and, defend and defend the, the right. right. And they all exit drums, etc. Um... Several things I've noted here. Um, I mean, Richard really has a bit of a tantrum at the end there, isn't it? Just kill them all. Um, get You know, uh, we're back to the uh, calling for death. Um, Lancaster really steps up in the absence of Woodstock, Ooh. doesn't he? Um, God, yes. You know, he's really starting to do some speechifying and they're really, really pushing the French angle here, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Uh, your supplies from France. You from France. Um, which is, um, yeah, pushing yeah, it a bit in real terms. Uh, <laughs> well, considering that Lancaster was born in Ghent, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in terms of propaganda, you know, they've come over with a load of French, Frenchmen, uh, French supplies, and, and, you know, they're going to push that angle all the way with mm. their own, especially with their own troops. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Other the, thoughts? Um, the choric um, ending of this scene I found both interesting and strange. Um, I think it's, I, I understand that it's there to clearly indicate the faction uh, division, but um, it also felt very sort of, um, I don't know, almost like a, like a, a yeah, children's show or something you know, oversimplifying to a great extent. I don't, it's not or the like first a new... time we've had this in this play, though, haven't we? We've had a few group mm. uh, exclamations. They're like, yeah, they're like, the, they, they're sort of stylized, almost like a modern musical, sort of. Yeah, thing. there's something stylistically different from the rest of the play in this in this use of, yes, you're right, we've, we've had it before, um, these, this use of uh, choric lines. That um, I, I just I found I've found it strange before, but at this particular point, it's sort of you can almost see them dividing, you know, uh, into two camps on the stage and shouting at each other, and it's sort of this is not that movie. Well, we get it at heightened moments, don't we? Because we got it right at the beginning with when the lords discovered the plot to being poisoned. You, I think we had some choric action there, didn't we? So it's like we we get it at these very heightened moments in the script. Um, and it, yeah, which... I, and they are squ squared off, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. You know, they, they are squared off different sides of the stage, presumably, uh, you know, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Um, I think it could work quite well, dramatically, with mm. them facing off against each other. I don't think it has to be, you know, absurd. I think it could be quite powerful depending on how you staged it. Well, it is well, also going thing, into drums so visuals... and larins and excursions. Sorry, yeah. Alexandra, sorry. No, I was, I was just saying, this is the thing. The visuals of that uh, division work really well. The fact that it's put into writing as such a, a, a an obvious and a, um, I don't know what the word is. There's something, like I said, there's something stylistically different to the rest of the play. Um, the fact that it's put into the writing in this way is the thing that I'm sort of seeing as in a modern production uh, likely to look ridiculous. I feel that they're just effectively hints to the director. Mm. Mm. Encoded stage directions. Yes, that there are people on either side shouting. I'm, I'm getting the feeling sharks to the left, jets to the right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, okay, well, that, we flag, I think we flagged that one up sufficiently for uh, future directors what to do with that. Um, you know, uh, you make a decision. You don't have to, uh, f you know, we can make it one person. Everyone else just goes raw. Um, uh, but I mean, it's a good, good point to raise. Any other thoughts about that scene and what's going on? So we have a, a fair panoply of, uh, of, uh, of people we've met before. Um, Yes, I think it it started off with the possibility that it would be a peace negotiation. Mm. And what with Lancaster on one side and Richard on the other. Not but as hope in hell. <laughs> but as soon as Lancaster says that one of their conditions will be that all the favourites have to be dismissed, that's effectively the end of the negotiation. Mm. Mm. It's like the third crucible scene, isn't it? We keep having this. They Things kind of rise to a point where everybody meets and oh how's it gonna go first one was the wedding oh that's gone badly um second one was the meeting of parliament how's that gonna go oh that's gone badly and then this is the third one and oh it's gone badly yeah, yeah there's just, there's too many immovable objects really aren't there um sort of crashing um but anyway, uh, let's see where it goes. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll all be fine. I'm sure it'll all be fine. Uh, it'll all be fine in the end. Okay. So there's an alarum. Enter Green and Cheney. They meet armed. Stand, traitor, for thou canst not escape my sword. What villain fronts me with the name of traitor? What's thou, false Cheney? Now, by King Richard's love, I'll tilt thy soul out for that base reproach. I would, thy master and the late protector, mid both his treacherous brothers, Gaunt and York, were all opposed with thee to try these arms. I'd seal it on all your hearts. This shall suffice to free the kingdom from their villainies. And there's an alarum. They fight and enter Arundel. Thou hunts the noble game, right warlike Cheney. Cut but this visor off, that heals the kingdom. Yield thee, false traitor. Most detested man that set us King Richard against his reverend uncles to shed their royal bloods and make the realm weak for their timeless desolation. Cast down thy weapons, for by this my sword will bear free from this place alive or dead. Come both then, I'll stand firm and dare your worst. He that flies from it be his soul accursed. And they fight, and Green is slain. So may the foes of England fall in blood, most dissolute traitor. Up with his body, Cheney, and hail it to the taint of Lancaster. And enter the king, Bagot, Bushy, Scroop, and soldiers. Stand firm, my lord. Here's rescue. Courage, then. We'll bear his body hence in spite of them. And they fight, and then to them enter a Lancaster, York, and Surrey. They and they beat them all away. Exit fighting remains the king with Green's corpse. Oh, princely youth, King Richard's dearest friend, what heavy star this day had dominance to cut off all thy flowering hope, youthful hopes. Prosper, proud rebels, as you dealt by him, hard-hearted uncles, unrelenting churls, that here have murdered all my earthly joys. Oh, my dear Green, wert thou alive to see how I'll revenge thy timeless tragedy on all their heads that did but lift a hand to hurt this body that I held so dear. Even by this kiss and by my crown, I swear. And there is an alarum interrupting this moment. Enter Bagot, Bushy and Scroop to the king. Away, my lord, stand not to wail his death. The field is lost, our soldiers shrink and fly. La Paul is taken prisoner by the Lord. High to the tower, there is no help in sort. Still to continue war with childishness, their odds are mountain, ours a molehill in it. Let, let's fly to London and make strong the tower. Loud pro proclamations post throughout the camp with promise of reward to all that take us. 
get safety for our lives, my princely lord. If here we stay, we shall be all betrayed. Oh, my dear friends, the fearful wrath of heaven sits heavy on our heads for Woodstock's death. Blood cries for blood, and that almighty hand permits not murder unrevenged to stand. Come, come, we yet may hide ourselves from worldly strength, but heaven will find us out and strike at length. Each lend a hand to bear this load of woe. Let us King Richard loud and tended so. And they exit and finally the body of Green gets taken off. Um, it's interesting the action of that, that you have these, these different uh, forces coming on. They, they, um, uh, uh, and the, it is a, a, a really nice melee with things going on. You get a two against one fight. Always nice to see uh, a fair, fair, fair fight. Why would you have a fair fight when you can have an unfair fight? There's, 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 you know, <laughs> this idea of one-to-one one one combat. Why would you do it? Um, it's tender moment between Richard and Green, um, you know, which has been presaged all the way through the play and is now made much more explicit. Um, the cries of blood cries for blood. Um, we've heard that one before many, many times in this forum. Um, but we also get Bushy and uh, and Bagot, you know, showing their, their their true minion status of what's their plan? Hide, hide. Good plan. Um, it's not going well. Um, thoughts about this little scenet? I think there's a typo in the last line. Actually, uh, there's I, the, there's one or two that I've noticed. It, it should be loved, not loud. It is loved. Yes. Mm. Makes much more sense as loved. Yeah. Yeah. I have been making notes as I've gone along. I, I, I haven't w bothered to trouble you with the many, many minor typos. Um, that's part of the exercise is to tidy up the script as we go. Yeah. But it um, does change the meaning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, other thoughts about the scene? I'm trying to remember the syndrome whereby you zoom from one extreme emotion to another because whatever it is, Richard's got it. Bipolar? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's possible. Um, seems I mean, a bit more violent than that. Mm. I mean, it, I mean, it's the, it's the second time he, he's had to uh, do a mad speech following the death of a loved one. Yeah, where he goes Two from scenes. Yeah, where he goes from grief to to anger. Um, mm. That seems to be a, a you know call to revenge. Um, and then despair. Mm. Heaven will find us out and strike at length. Mm. Um, it's, he's got an enormous evolution, I think, throughout the play. Um, but it's it's quite nice to to see in these two situation in these two scenes that um, could be played quite similarly. Actually, you know, you could, as as we've pointed out, he's grieving for one person and then he's grieving for another person. Um, I think it's also really interesting if, by mining the text, if we find different, because I think there are different colours to um, how he is grieving. Um, what I'm getting is it's sort of just just um, from what we've from how we've presented it. Um, I'm I'm getting almost like a, a breakdown feeling I'm, I'm getting the impression that he's having this it, you know the nation or the 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 country in a symbolic sense and he in a in a an exact one are collapsing mm. which i thought was interestingly done textually mm. yeah and that's actually um borne out as well by the context because with anne's death that comes, I mean, okay, there's lots of plotting going on in the background, but that comes at a relatively peaceful time. It's before it all kicks off. And he comes in and he's, you know, wailing and, and moaning and he and he wants to raise the castle of Sheen. Um, so you have this king going like mad with grief within a relatively calm moment in time. This is the reverse 
this is you've got all this stuff going on around you you've got death and battles and it actually it's a it, although he is still wailing and bemoaning green's death it's a much quieter um form of um grieving so it's a, it's the reverse Be before it was calm and then he was really loud and, and whaley and now it's all everything around him is is crazy and loud and he's actually far more broken yeah you can, uh, it's a still response. point it's, it's a still, still point, point yeah. in the middle of a battle. You can almost see yeah. the people running around him still doing things, but mm. the focus is on him. Mm. You know, that everyone else is in slow motion and he's there uh, having his moment. Yeah, and that backs up though what uh, uh, Alexandra was saying about him, you know, breaking down. Like, mm. it's, it, because that's what happens, isn't it? Like, the, the quieter you become, the, uh, the probably the more in trouble uh, he is. Mm. Liz? Uh, and there's also a, a realize that there seems to be a realization on his part of his wrongdoing. Heaven will find us out. I think that is is quite significant. It's almost as though he suddenly realized he did wrong. Mm. Mm. He yeah. had that he's, before, though, he's been, didn't he? Yeah. Yes, when after Anne's death, mm. he sends to have Woodstock not killed. Mm. Yes, on true. the grounds yeah. that heaven is obviously yeah. against him. Mm. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's compounded. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Stephen. Yes. Um, I was just, I was just thinking. Um, there's a kind of change of pace, isn't there? It's uh, there's Richard's uh, the performance of Richard is it's greatly increased in terms of range, um, so, which is setting us up for a very different ending to the character he's been through most of the play. Um, we've had a, you know, we've had a lot of kind of set pieces, which are which are both sort of character things, but they're but they're also room for the actor to kind of really stretch their wings, and he's he stopped being this kind of irritating teenager, and he's getting these, you know, um, big passions scenes, so that um, he's he's gaining in status through the range of these kind of performances, and that then sets us up for some kind. Of, of potential reconciliation at the end where we don't just think, oh my God, the guy's such an idiot. He's going, you know, next time he gets a sugar rush, he's going to cut somebody's head off or something, which is kind of where we are through, through the play. So there's a sort of change of, di seems to me there's a change of direction perhaps. Uh, and in terms of performance, we get, we're getting a very different Richard uh, in, in the final sort of half hour or 40 minutes. Well, it's it's also interesting. He, he he seems to borrow a Woodstock verbal tick in that last week. He does a come come, mm -hmm. and Woodstock mm -hmm. does these little repeated uh, words or phrases and these little things. And it, it, it's 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 weird because he just mentions Woodstock and then he appropriates a Woodstockism um, mm. in a sort of weird weird way and I, I i find that quite interesting i mean it's it's probably just there's a bit of a pause but you know um it i i i, I like to think of it that way there, there's very little left to do so i think we should do it uh before we uh, we go into extra time um so i'm going to run the next two scenes together uh we're going to go into act five scene five enter tresillion disguised with nimble where art thou nimble as light as a feather my lord I have put off my shoe that I might run lustily. The battle's lost, and the prisoners. What shall we do, my lord? Yonder's a ditch. We may run along that nerby scene, I warrant. I did suspect no less, and so tis form. The day is lost, and dashed are all our hopes. King Richard's taken prisoner by the peers. Oh, that I were upon some steepy rock where I might tumble headlong to the sea before those cruel lords do seize on me. Oh, that I were transformed into a mouse, that I might creep into any hole in the house and dare not. Come, Nimble, tis no time to use delay. I'll keep me in this poor disguise a while, and so unknown prolonged, prolong my weary life, in hope King Richard shall conclude my peace. And there's the sounding of a retreat. Hark, hark, the trumpets call the soldiers back. Retreat is sounded. Now the... Time serves fit, and we may steal from hence. Away, good nimble. Nay, stay, my lord. Slid, and ye go that way. Farewell. But, and you'll be ruled by me, I have thought of a trick that ye shall escape them almost bravely. Bethinks thyself, good nimble, quickly, man. 
I'll meditate, my lord, and then I'm for ye. Now, nimble, show thyself a man of valour. Think of thy fortunes. Tis a hanging matter if thou conceal him. Besides, there's a thousand marks for him that takes him with the duke's favours and a free pardon. Besides, he's but a coward. He would now run from battle else. Saint Anthony assist me, I'll set upon him presently. My lord, I've thought upon this trick. I must take ye prisoner. How prisoner? There's one way to escape else. Then must I carry yet to the king's uncles, who presently condemns ye for a traitor, sends ye away to hanging, and then God bless my lord Tresillian. Wilt thou betray thy master, villain? I, if my master be a villain, you think tis nothing for a man to be hanged for his master. You hear not the proclamation. What proclamation? Oh, sir, all the country's full of them. That whosoever sees you does not presently take ye and bring ye to the lords shall be hanged for his labour. Therefore, no more words, lest I raise the whole camp upon ye. Ye see one of your own swords of justice drawn over ye. Therefore go quietly, lest I cut your head off and save the hangman a labour. Oh, villain. No more words. Away, sir. Exuant as the worm has turned and into Act 5, Scene 6. There's the sounding of the retreat repeats. Then a flourish. Enter with victory. Lancaster, Cheney, Arundel, Surrey, and soldiers with Lapool, Bushy, and Scroop prisoners. Thus princely Edward's sons in tender care of wanton Richard and their father's realm have toiled to purge fair England's pleasant field of all those rancorous weeds that choked the grounds and left her pleasant meads like barren hills. Who else can tell us which way Bagot fled? Some say to Bristol to make strong the castle. See that the ports be laid. He'll fly the land for England. For he'll fly the land, for England hath no hold can keep him from us. Had we Tresillian hanged, then all was sure. Where slept our scouts that he escaped the field? He fled, they say, before the fight began. Our proclamation soon shall find him forth the root and ground of all these vile abuses. And enter here nimble with Tresillian bound and guarded. How now, what guard is that? What traitor's there? The traitor now is Tain. I here present the villain. And if he needs will know his name, God bless my lord Tresillian. Tresillian, my lord, attach them pre and apprehended by this man. Yes, and it please ye, my lord, twas I that took him. I was once a trampler in the law after him, and I thank him he taught me this trick to save myself from hanging. Thou art a good lawyer, and hast removed the cause from thyself fairly. I have removed it with a habeas corpus, and then I took him with sorcerous and bound him in this box. Nay, I have still my learning, I can tell ye, my lord, there was not a stone between Westminster Hall and Temple Bar, but I have told them every morning. What moved thee, being his man, to apprehend him? Partly for the causes. First, the fear of the proclamation, for I have plodded and ploughed and can find no law. That's all, folks. Sadly, that is where the, <laughs> the manuscript ends. And so the question is, does Nimble get his comeuppance or does he get away with it? We do not know. We only know that Tresillian has been caught with his own, well, with his own theme song <laughs> from earlier in the play. I love it. Um... <laughs> I love the fact, yeah, the worm turns at the end, nimble turns, um, mm. set up from that first scene and in many ways not really yeah. picked up again until now. Um, uh, you know, and that very, I love the way, you know, Tresillian says, hurry up, and so he does an incredibly long aside. <laughs> the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we don't get a reconciliation scene at the end. We don't know precisely how the play leaves it all there isn't actually that much to do to wrap everything up 
Um, I mean, it could be incredibly long. You could you could spend quite a long time tidying up the uh, the loose ends at the end of the play. Um, I'll ask for a brief thoughts here, and then I I, I think I'll uh, th uh, throw a a, a a a line to Stephen to for his uh, overall thoughts and and any background stuff that uh, he may have uh, uh, prepared for this particular session. Um, so yes, about the ending, but also about the play itself. It is just possible that Arundel and Nimble talking walk away and that's the end of the play. I mean, that isn't how it was because there is text missing, but it could be done just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yes, I'm, I'm not convinced. Up, yeah. No, no, it's not very satisfactory. <laughs> this no. is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, I was thinking that sort of thing. Yeah. Or um, he could have him by the scruff of the neck and be march, frog marching him off or something, yeah. leaving no... Uh... <laughs> I, I, I would actually forecast for Nimble probably similar foot to fortune that occurred to the two murderers. Well, no. yeah, I mean, that's the question. Does Nimble get away with it? Uh, I mean, in many ways, I I'm more concerned it. about that than I am about Richard II and what happens with his uncles. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, I think he does. I want him to. Yeah. I think he does. He probably gets promoted. He probably, yeah. Chief Justice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the proclamation said that he would get away mm. with it. Mm. 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 And these lords uh, ha, ha, are putting their reputation on being people of their word. What we, what we could have here is um, finally we get the lords and the commons coming together because they've kind of been kept apart, haven't they? Mm, yeah. But, you know, it, it is a, there is this whole sort of romantic kingship and romantic lordship trope in the period, which is, you know, if the commoners could only kind of get face to face with these great nobles, they'd get on swimmingly, you know, mm. hence wandering around with disguises on and, you know, merry fellowship and so forth. So it, it, there could be an element of that in it because the commons are quite important to the mental world of the play. Mm. Uh, and the, uh, you know, the, whatever you want to call them, you know, York and Lancaster, that party claim to be representing the nation. And so there, you know, there could be quite a nice, tie up here in a sort of uh, you know some kind of embodied fellowship it would it would fit with a lot of where i think the play has been going hmm. so where so, do you, th you think the play has been going sir uh, do you want me to start <laughs> well, I, 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 everyone well, seems a little becalmed so i'll let everyone gather their thoughts for their final thoughts so gather um, a final thought people <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll, shall I do some factual stuff first off? Oh, yeah, um, throw, throw, yeah so, throw some facts. Throw some facts. So, um, in terms of dating, um, nobody's done anything on it for about 20 years, but, but there's a fairly plausible t two elements of dating. One is sort of first decade, perhaps, of the 17th century. Um, and it, it's, it's been attached to uh, a guy called William Rowley. Uh, William Rowley? William, Samuel Rowley. Uh, a who's, who's a kind of clown figure uh, and then there's uh, on the manuscript there's some names of actors which point to a revival in the 1630s which is quite interesting in terms of the way where the politics of the country is going at that point um, so that's the first thing in terms of date it used to be thought that it was a, a pre-Shakespearean play but um, people are a bit, bit skeptical of that now it fits in with a, a set of representations of, of the, the Peasants' Revolt, the world of the Peasants' Revolt. Um, so we have the play Jack Straw, which um, Rob has already looked at. Uh, there's also a, a record uh, by Simon Foreman, the astro astrologer, of a, of a play about the Peasants' Revolt being put on at the Globe in 1611. Um, and there is this tendency to kind of to kind of say, oh, well, you know, commoners always get a bad deal. But, but Foreman's note um, when William Woolworth stabs Jack Straw, i.e. when the Lord Mayor of London kills the kind of head of the commons rising, is to say, beware by this example of noblemen and their fair words. So there's a, there's a kind of tradition we can glimpse, perhaps, um, which is about much more sympathetic representations of the commons 
than um, than perhaps some people have thought. So I think the, the play is really interesting because there's plenty of stuff about Commons Risings, but there's nothing about what ha what's happened after the Commons Rising. And this is set in a post-Commons Rising world. It's set after 1381, which is the Peasants' Revolt. You know, they've taken London, they've sacked London. And all through the play, people are saying the Commons will be up, the Commons will rise, the Commons will rebel. And there's a kind of constant tension here uh, that this is all going to kick off again. And it's kicking off because of uh, Richard's misrule. Now, the play Jack Straw uh, makes a great deal, as, as do the Chronicles, of Richard's personal courage. As a 14-year-old, he rides to Smithfield and he meets with the rebel leaders. And this is the point at which Tyler or Straw, depending on who you're listening to, gets killed. But as a 14-year-old, he has the right stuff. And then, you know, the kind of hormones kick in or whatever it is. And there's this period of, of misrule. Um, but it's still negotiating the aftermath of, of what it would be like to live in a country where there has been a, a, a major commons rising. Now, it hasn't succeeded in the sense that, you know, it's been put down. But this is about the mentality, the mentality at court because of that and how it enables you to think about the, the nation. So it's about the commons, even though they hardly appear being imposed upon the mental world of the court and i think that's really really interesting as a kind of back backdrop in the play um Tresillian is the guy who tried and condemned john ball who is the radical preacher associated with uh, the peasants revolt john john ball is the kind of ideological backbone of it you know his his sermons explaining the kind of theological justification for rising up against against your bonds is quoted at length in the chronicles so to have Tresillian here uh, being portrayed as he is i think is it's one of those kind of it, it makes a different kind of sense if you presume an audience or writers who are a bit more in the know about all of this um, they've read the chronicles uh, and they, they would know that he'd done this. And previous representations of Tresillian present him as a tragic figure. There's a, there's a book called Mirror for Magistrates, which is a long, long, long series of laments by people who've died. And Woodstock's in it, and Richard is in it, and Tresillian is in it as a kind of tragic figure. And it shows the fall of kings and the fall of princes and how the wheel turns. Here he's not presented like that at all. So there's a break with kind of ways of understanding the falls of great people with Tresillian. And I, I think that that's interesting. Um, uh, two more points to make. One is uh, that uh, Richard's sort of boy racer absolutism uh, appropriates elements of good fellowship um, that are generally associated with the commons. So uh, feasting, things being topsy-turvy, um, the masking, which is, um, in the sort of 16th century political context, certainly in sort of early and mid 16th century, you know, there's actually an act passed against masks and visors in public places because the, the kind of the gentry were just using, you know, they were, um, there was an awful lot of feuds going on, particularly in the country. And the gentry were kind of knocking on doors in masks and kidnapping people and beating them up and so forth. So there's a, there's a kind of strange, topsy-turviness here with the king, the misled king, behaving uh, as the commons are supposed to behave when they get a bit of power, which is to just kind of, you know, splurge on consumer goods and, and hang out with your mates and feast and uh, uh, think about the world of, of the flesh. Um, and then there's the analysis of the, the machinery of uh, the state as it bears down upon the individual. Uh, the blank charters, uh, and I, I was startled when I when I thought when I worked on the play to find out that uh, whistling treason is actually a 17th century uh, term. It's in the OED. It seems to be this kind of ridiculous notion that uh, you can be arrested for whistling treason. But people, you know, uh, somebody in the 1670s says, "I dare not whistle treason. I know what I think." And the earliest uh, 
record of it in the OED when I looked, which is a while back. It's, it's the 1620s. So it's, it's interesting, I think, that the play goes into so much detail at this sort of level of society, about what it's like to be oppressed. Not oppressed in the sense of somebody grinding your face in the dirt, but the, the kind of abuse of, um, you know, the landlordism, the farming, the renting that's going on, which is, which is a continual complaint against Richards. But the, the machinery of that is given an awful lot of air in this play i think we don't see the commons rising but we can see why they have risen in the past this kind of thing has been going on and it so it strikes me as um uh and it's just it's a complete fluke that we've got this play because it just happens to be a manuscript bound in a collection of manuscripts that belong to an ex-actor you know, it's it's just a complete coincidence that we've got it. We've never printed, and so it it sort of expands our sense a little bit, I think, of how uh, the early modern commons could be seen. We are so saturated with um, the, the nobles' point of view, mentioning no names. <laughs> Mentioning, well, okay, Marlowe, for example. <laughs> um, okay, I'll stop, I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop there, but um, James is on the throne when this is written. James has just been on the throne for a while, uh, and there's some interesting chiming with what James mm. is up to. Yes. Male favourites, etc. <laughs> this is... That was absolutely fascinating because I, I, I mean, all my information had come from Rossiter. Yeah. Which is, you know, as far as I was concerned, I, I didn't know about your work. So I, I went to Rossiter and I was looking at it in terms of 1592. I was looking at it in terms of the raising of the Privy Seal loan, action in Star Chamber, the rise of Cook and the seditious libel and, you know, the whole the whole thing, and it seemed to fit pretty perfectly. But if you say there was a performance, a revival performance possibly in the 1630s, that is dynamite in the 1630s, because there you have a king who is generally assumed to be immature and childish. And I mean, and then, and ship money. I mean, the 1630s is a powder keg. You put this play into the 1630s and you've got a whole different ball game. Mm. It, 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 does, it does strike you, you just go, I can't really believe that this, anyone would consider printing this, considering how um, you know, aggressively antique Richard it is uh, throughout. I mean, we've, we've been commenting on you know, that they, they, they don't give him much of a chance until very, very late in the day. Um, it's also a historical confection. I mean, it's mm. it's a complete sort of mashup of what mm. actually happened. You know, this is this is not history at all. No. You know, as as we would recognise it. Yes. So yes. It, it's been put together for a particular purpose, if you mm. like. Well, that rather defines a history play, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, but it, it, there's a difference between telescoping and, and effectively moving characters who have been dead for a very long time or, or will be dead and, and, and swapping them around and, 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 and killing people in different, different time periods. And, you know, all, all of the events here are sort of right, but they're really not in the right order. Um, <laughs> I think that's pretty much my opening gambit was to say that this is very um, Anton preview. Um, it, it, it has all of those elements. And I think in many ways it works best well, so well as a play, I think because it takes those liberties actually um, with, with history. I'm, I'm going to have to wind us all up now. So final thoughts around the room, uh, please. Uh, Pamela, do you have any thoughts? Um, a couple of things. Firstly, just how much I have enjoyed this play. Uh, not knowing anything about it, I have very much enjoyed it. Um, I'm loving Helen's theory about it being a lawyer. And on the very last page, we have that line about you are a good lawyer, um, which makes me think you might be absolutely right, Helen. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I guess just finally, the thing I, I've kind of noticed most and what I've quite enjoyed is the, the repetitions of images within it or, you know, like the idea of the crucible, the nature theme that came up a few times. Um, yeah, that's kind of my two uh, pence. Excellent. Uh, Tamara, any, any final thoughts? 
I've some things become more uh, fixed in my mind, um, which has sort of taken hold since we started reading it. And that is that I'd really like to see this produced or even be involved in the production of this because it feels incredibly modern. <laughs> um, uh, aside from the fact that, you know, the costumes are clearly period and I don't, and I think you lose a lot of the early humor if you try to do it without the actual what was it toad knees need toes mm. <laughs> um but i i can see it done otherwise in terms of topics and and the the generational things that we've said that we see more than was possibly meant to be in there but um yeah i'm i'm rambling horribly but there's so many things that you could do with it as a production and it would be so very interesting to to explore all of that. So, well, I mean, having done Jack Straw as audio, and we had hoped to be doing it on stage uh, this year, that's not going to be happening uh, for a while. Um, this is very much on the next to do list. The advantage with plays about history is that you can tie them together and build seasons and create uh, sort of economies of scale. And Woodstock is very much on the on the list next to do as an audio uh, with a view to do as as staging because it's just just too good um, and uh, it, you know it's it's very high on that list now. Uh, Sarah, any final thoughts? Um, my final thought is that I I'm so impressed uh, with the construction of this play and the way it takes um, well that I've spotted, probably there's more, but it takes like three um, constructs that are used over and over in literature later on. And it weaves them together um, just beautifully. So you've, you've, got the, you've got the fact that it's not just about lords. Um, the common people are actually represented in a, um, a, a, a quite an authentic and sympathetic way and the action kind of bounces back and forth between them and the court. Um, and of course, I mean, that's Dickens. Uh, this is what Dickens did so beautifully. You know, he, he, he was able to just move between uh, environments and realms. Um, you've got the whole um, multiple climax uh, uh, aspect of, uh, of plot construction, which is something that Jackie Collins uh, uh, did so well uh, in that, you know, uh, it, you, you have everybody, you have all the different forces coming together, you build up, there's a little climax, it all goes pear-shaped, oh, and then we start again and it builds up and then there's another crucible, oh, and then it builds up again. And I mean, that's something that's become incredibly, um, it's become just basically how TV dramas are written, you know, over multiple parts, that's, that's how they're constructed. Um, so you've got that. Um, and then you've also got this, uh, this kind of amazing thing with Nimble and Tresillion, where um, right at the beginning of the play, it's deliberately set up, I think, so that you think, oh, you know, there's a tension there. All this stuff is, is, is put in about how Nimble and Tresillion were at school together, and Tresillion's climbed to great heights and Nimble hasn't, and you think, oh, that's gonna, that's gonna go pear-shaped, that relationship, there's gonna be a worm turn there. Um, and then it all goes away and Nimble starts to behave like this loyal retainer. And you think, oh, okay, that's not gonna, that's, that's, that's not gonna be how it pans out. And then right at the end, boom, that twist comes round again. And actually the guy who you thought was gonna turn out to be a bit guilty is guilty of the very thing you have suspected at the beginning, but then you are lulled into this false sense of security. And of course that is something that Agatha Christie and every single murder mystery plot writer users over and over again so you've got three really that are now uh, really kind of standard and popular plot constructs but i've i i mean i i don't know a lot about early um playwrights but like this is a, such a fantastic example of how all three of these you know by now quite standard plot constructs are woven together at a time when just the presence of one of them would be interesting so I, I just think the construction of it is really clever um, and just, I've really enjoyed it. 
Liz, any final Ooh, thoughts? Gosh, I can't follow up on anything. Well, no, I, I think I was really impressed by the clarity of this play. Um, and the character that stood out really for me, I found it very touching, was the whistler, actually. Right from the very first scene when he's walking down. Well, I was only whistling for my, ca my calves. I lost my calves. And then he gets to be hung anyway in the end. I mean, I find that, I really did find that quite tragic. Maybe I'm over emotional. And the other thing is a silly comment. I wondered if anyone heard any plaintive whinnying in the ghost scene. Uh, I didn't, no. You didn't? Uh, okay, all right. So maybe the horse didn't get eaten then. <laughs> 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 um, I did it. <laughs> I had forgot the horse. Yes. Oh, you can't forget the horse. Very worried about the horse. Uh, uh, we'll go, uh, Helen next. Then uh, Valentina, if you want to say something, uh, I'll give you the run-up first. But Helen first. I uh, no, I'm still in a state of shock. I, I'm going to take a, a, about a year to process all this. <laughs> <laughs> Valentina is a, a new newcomer to the group. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously I joined you for today, but I did follow the, the, the previous days. So, um, I mean, similarly to Tamara, I think like it's, it's incredible for me how like in, instantly recognizable some of the relationships are in between the parties and in between the characters as well, even now. And the fact that it was written so long ago, it doesn't really matter. And it's not like, because some of these relations, like, you know, like, you, like usually it's, you recognize them, but it's between family. But in this case, it's more um, a social cons construct that seems to repeat itself. Um, and the other thing, like, um, I mean, I think, like, it's lovely how the small characters are clear and well-written as well. And I loved um, La Poule, this kind of, like, merchant of life and death being really cool, going like, oh, I'm going to kill him. And then I'm going to bet on the fact that if I actually side with Richard, I might like, you know, we, we'll, we'll go over there. We might die. But there's more of a possibility of us winning than, you know, it's just like, it's all very calculated. And I don't know if it's just me, but um, the ghosts, I mean, I had in my mind the stardust ghosts just looking after uh, their family and just going like, oh, uh, don't, no, 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 uh, wake, wake up, wake, uh, wake, oh God, oh, he's dead, all right. But yeah, just kind of like sitting there with nothing to do, just going like, okay, yep, let's see how these ones is going. <laughs> like, yep. Uh, Alan, any final thoughts? Well, firstly, I've really enjoyed it. Secondly, I think actually the information that Stephen put there about this possibly being early 17th rather than late 16th um, possibly makes a bit of sense because we were looking at the language at the beginning of the week and thinking god this is incredibly modern um, compared with other bits that we've done from around the same period the other thought that occurred to me was that Stephen did mention at the beginning before we were recording that he got some notes on uh, someone had suggested how it ended uh, that I thought he was going to go away and uh, find the piece of paper. Uh, people, have people have written endings. Pe mm. um, there, there's a guy who did, these are three volumes of the four that he wrote on Woodstock. Um, oh. he, he, he did that because he thought it was written by somebody else. Oh, yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, in fact, he, he got so heated that he had a, a thousand dollar bet um, with another scholar, and uh, they appointed a panel to adjudicate amongst them. Um, but he, he wrote an, an ending which he thought was in keeping with it. And I think there's one somewhere, somebody did a, a, a script in hand or something a few years ago, and they wrote an ending as well. So it's, it's people extrapolate, extrapolating. So the more recent one was, it ends with, you know, Richard Musing. So it depends on your reading of the play, what needs to be to be tied up. So I, I, I have no idea, but some people have had a go at it. Mm. Mm. Alexandra, final, final thought then. Um, can I, may I say three? If you're Anyone quick, else? we are very, very going very over. Uh, one thing is, I was wondering who was this written for or who was it, who did have been sort of, you know, to who, for whose benefit? Because as you said, it's got a very skewed perspective of history. It's doing things for a purpose. So we don't need to answer that question, but I thought that would be interesting to, 
to, to know, uh, not only when historically it would have been done, but for whom. Uh, the other thing is, I agree with, with um, everybody who's, who's sort of raved about the narrative structure. I think structurally, this is a really, really beautifully constructed play. Um, and really little things that come back. It's very satisfying um, for us as an audience to receive them. You know, things like the Whistler and then the Whistler being mentioned again. Things like God bless my Lord Tresillian coming back to bite um, him, you know, as well as the bigger stuff, the, the beautiful big stuff. And then thirdly, um, I'm really interested in Richard as a character now, having mm -hmm. heard it rather than just reading it uh, on on my own, because I think not only does he travel, not only does he change a lot, but also there's a great deal that I think could be made in performance of these things that we now kind of, it, it's very easy for us to judge as, oh, he's just a movie teenager. Um, but actually, given the extraordinary nature of his life of his existence up to the, the point at the beginning of the play and also the the, unnet, the um, extraordinary nature of the experiences that he goes through just considering through the play um, it you know it makes sense that he would have these immense uh, reactions and these uh, that he would go to extreme lengths in in what he um, in what he feels and therefore in what he does as a consequence um, so if we could get that across to an audience, I think that would be a very interesting and a very rich um, character. That I'd well, love to I'm, see. Uh, as we have gone so massively over time, I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you all uh, to the readers. I think we've all uh, agreed that this is a fantastic play that should mm. really have been uh, given so much more stage time than it has been. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.